Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, we're going to get started with announcements while more people are joining the session. This session is being hosted by the UX Researchers Guild. Uh, by attending, you consent to our recording, editing, and using this content for educational and marketing purposes. Uh, first order of business, we have created a spreadsheet for those of you who want to share LinkedIn details and connect with others. So be looking for um, the link to a spreadsheet in the chat. Uh, Janine will be popping that in there. And throughout today's session, Janine will be helping us with uh, additional helpful links as well. So anytime you see Janine uh, pop a link in the chat, be sure to check that out. Um, also, uh, as a special treat following today's session, we will also offer some breakout room networking. So if you are interested in meeting some of the other attendees today, uh, be sure to stick around at the end. And uh, next order of business, next Friday on May 17th, we are going to be discussing job search councils with Tracy Hayes. Um, job search councils, uh, you may have heard of them. They are peer support groups for job seekers. Um, uh, many people like me, uh, we, we definitely need that um, in this day and age right now. The JSC program basically offers a clear process so that job seekers know where to focus their efforts and they have people surrounding them um, supporting their efforts as well. Um, the UXR Guild Job Search Councils will be UXR specific so if you are searching for uh, that type of position and you want to do it amongst your peers, um, that this is the perfect thing to join. So again, that is next Friday, May 17th. Uh, those of you who have attended our events before know that we like to do a small giveaway at the end. So our giveaway today is going to be a copy of the book, Never Search Alone by Phil Terry. Um, and Phil Terry is uh, sort of like the, the father or um, the parent of job search councils, uh, and this book will outline the process that our job search councils will also model. So to participate in the book giveaway, uh, you, you must live in the United States, uh, just for logistic purposes, um, and Danielle will suggest someone based on her favorite question asked in uh, the chat. So please keep dropping your questions in the chat throughout the presentation, uh, and at the end, we'll pause to do the giveaway. Okay, um, after that event on June 11th, we are hosting an exciting book group, our second book group this year with author Steve Portingle, um, the author of Interviewing Users. Uh, the second edition of his book came out last year. There are a lot of new changes um, to this book. So he's gonna be here to walk us through them and basically uh, help us learn that core skill of talking to users. Um, so be sure to sign up for that event as well. That one is on June 11th. And then finally, uh, the Guild has a few opportunities to join our team. Um, we'll be posting a link with details to that later in the session. Okay, so uh, without any further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce our special guest, Danielle Green. Danielle is a co-founder and research director of the UX Researchers Guild. She has worked in UX research and product strategy for a decade in domains such as educational technology, hardware, software as a service, B2B, e-commerce, and gaming. She's also a professor and the director of the Applied Cognitive Psychology User Experience Master's Program at Claremont Graduate University. And she is going to be presenting this uh, course that you're going to see today at UX Lisbon in two weeks. So we are getting a sneak peek of what she's going to be talking about. All right. I hope everybody's excited. Without further ado, Danielle, please take it away. Thank you. All right. Folks, I have a vision. And I'm really glad you're here today because I want you in on it. Um, my vision is that I'm going to rob a bank. You know, lots of people have tried to rob banks and they have failed. And some people throughout history have been successful robbing banks, right? 
this, this bank robbery is going to be very successful and I want you in on it. So you are cordially invited to join my heist. So I just need to know, are you in or are you out? And I only have time for like one clarifying question here. Um, lots of bank robbing prepping I need to go do. So what do you need to know to be in or out of this heist? Please drop it in the chat. What's the one question you'd like to ask me? Are you in or are you out? Well, all right. Concerning, some of you are a little too eager to play along here. Um, you are in the right webinar, don't worry. Ah, uh, yes. Some very producty, very producty responses. What's the success rate? What's the risk? Uh, no, I think we have a few creatives on the call as well because we're talking about outfits. All right, so many of you are asking some really good questions, right? Uh, what bank are we robbing? Um, and most of you are asking questions related to how. How are we going to rob the bank? Um, so which bank, but, but really how, how are we going to go about doing this? How are you going to rob the bank? You can't agree to take a big risk until you know what's the plan. What's the strategy? How are we going to rob the bank? So, okay, let's come back to reality, maybe to something a little bit more traumatic than criminal activity. You are in a board meeting. Yikes, right? You're at the long table. I mean, it's virtual usually these days, right? You're on the big virtual call. Maybe it's in a leadership offsite. You've uh, you've clearly dozed off. Um, no more Netflix shows on heists, maybe. So we want to know. Uh, here we are at the at the leadership offsite. We want to know what's your product strategy. How are you going to rob the bank? I mean, how are you going to deliver value to the market? And often as product and UX folks, we don't feel very confident about our answers here. Or maybe our colleagues and our leaders are not so confident about whatever proposed strategy we're putting together. That's like, even if you nail down a strategy, right? So... I used to flinch a little bit when I heard the word strategy. I think the word comes with a lot of baggage. It has become this mystical thing, like magical thing. It hangs out with its friends, vision and mission, right? It's something that MBAs, only MBAs can do at the, at the top floor of a really tall building and they have the high quality snacks in that room for some reason. The strategy. If you look up stock image, images of strategy, um, you'll get a lot of young white males holding shiny things or holding red things. Mystical, magical strategy. Um, AI did a little bit better with this. At least AI knows that diversity is a thing. And also that graphs are involved in doing the magical strategy. <laughs> Very good AI. I'm honestly, I'm honestly sick of it. I'm sick of the ambiguity around the term strategy. I'm sick of the exclusivity that perpetuates the ambiguity. And, and so I just want to align this group around the definition which is why I started with bank robbing. So the strategy is how, how you will rob the bank, how you will deliver value to the market. It's not, but it's often confused for the goal. The goal is to rob the bank, um, but that's not the strategy. The strategy is how you're gonna rob the bank. 
the the rob the bank is more of the mission and vision statement. We're gonna fill the world with more heists and while also making some money. But that it was never about the money. It was about the heist. Our our mission is heists. Okay, I'm on a soapbox. So strategy is the how. How am I gonna rob the bank? That's the goal. And you know there are lots of ways to rob a bank. Brute force, um, explosives infiltrate the bank some kind of disguisey stealthy thing maybe cyber attacks we never even have to be on site at the bank right those are strategies we have allowed strategy to become this mystical thing but i want to quote and kind of paraphrase uh richard ramel the author of good strategy bad strategy and he says don't call it a strategy if you want to get anything done call it an action agenda Love it. So we're all aligned here, though. How to rob the bank. That's the strategy. Now I want to talk a little bit about what it's like to be someone in product or UX who's responsible for strategy and why I think the traditional approaches that we use today are not enough to set us up for success. And let me tell you, I've had everything, all kinds of good work behind me. I've had data-driven user personas and a journey map with 50 qualitative interviews and like a three-month field study behind it and some really beautiful jobs to be done uh, documents. Like no matter what good work I've done or my team has done, I still feel uncertainty about declaring a product strategy. Like all of these things are really valuable deliverables, but I've come to the conclusion that they're not really the best way to set someone up to make a strategic decision to decide how to rob the bank. Like if I'm trying to decide how to rob the bank, I'm probably not going to make a cutesy little dating profile-esque thing about the bank personnel with like a fun name, like rob the banker. And like whether he's an extrovert or an introvert and what social media apps he uses and what he does on the weekends. Okay, I'm soapboxing on user personas. Um, I'm probably not gonna do that if I'm gonna try to figure out how to rob the bank, right? So some of that stuff uh, about rob the banker might actually be relevant to how we're robbing the bank, depending, right? But I think this is the problem in product. I think that we need a better starting place, like a better way to start that sets us up for that effective strategic decision making. And after a decade in the biz, I mean, I've I've worked for 15, maybe even 20 organizations at this point across a dozen industries. And like Helen was saying, I'm the director of a UX master's program. I'm in charge of the curriculum. And I'm trying to think about how to train these early career UX professionals who are entering the field. And I'm thinking about these frameworks. I, I review a hundred personas and journey maps. And I watch these bright people wrestle, like wrestle with the limitations of some of these common deliverables when it comes to just strategic thinking. So I've been looking for a better way. And I've done a lot of thinking, and I, I think I've come up with a better starting place for product and UX professionals when it comes to strategic research. And I'm, I'm shooting for something that just gets us 80% of the way there about 80% of the time. And I'm finally ready to get this thing out there, share this framework with a bunch of people, get some feedback, refine it. And that's what I'm doing here today. I'm going to share with you this framework for strategic product research. And I think the best way to do that is to talk about how to rob banks. So um, let's say you're the one deciding how to rob the bank. You will probably want, I mean, your product folks, right? So you'll probably want some key information about the situation, about the bank, about the context. So you're going to ask things like you were asking in the chat. Um, what kind of bank is it? Where is it? Uh, what's the architecture of the building? What are the roads around the bank like? Like, let's plan our escape route, right? How secure is the bank? Does it have a vault? What is the vault like? Personnel. 
you're going to want this laundry list of information about the bank. And you might be able to imagine that if we robbed a lot of banks, we might even develop a nice, neat little process, like maybe a checklist template of information that we need about each bank to decide how best to rob it. And that's why we're product people and not bank robbers, I think. So that checklist of information to decide on the strategy, that's what I created. That's what I'm going to share with you here today. Um, I have this template of information, and I think that it sets product decision makers up to be able to make more confident and effective strategic decisions. So spoiler, that's that's the thing. That's the framework. So I want to talk a little bit first about the anatomy, the anatomy of the framework that I'm proposing. And I'm saying that there are four categories of information that every team needs to cover. Every team needs to cover um, to make informed strategic choices. And I call them the four strategic vantage points. And they are perspectives that your team needs to take to get a clear picture of the situation so that you know how best to approach it. And again, like these aren't new. These are really familiar. Uh, they pull from a lot of things that we already do, but I've tweaked, reframed, repackaged, refined these things. So the four vantage points that your team needs to understand are understand the need, understand the need, understand the people, understand the context, and then you need to understand the value. Those are the four vantage points. So I want to take a look at each of these in a little bit more detail, and then we'll go into it. So the need. This maps pretty closely to the problem space. Stay in the problem space, folks. Yeah, you say that a lot. But oftentimes, we don't really de define what it means to stay in the problem space. And we don't define what it is that we need while we're in that space together. Like, how do we make decisions in that space? So instead of saying problem, I think need is a better, it, it encompasses the problem to solve or the desired state that people want to achieve. So you need to understand the need. You also need to understand the people. Notice I don't say users, I'm saying people. There are people who experience the problem or they seek to achieve that desired state. And then there are all of the people who influence them. So the people need to be understood. Then you need to understand the context, which are the forces at play in the market, the competitors, the situational factors that relate to the people and the needs that they have. And then finally, you need to understand the value. To really know how to rob the bank, you need to understand the resources, the capabilities, and the constraints on your team and out there in the world that will affect the needs, the people in their context. So, these are the, the four definitions. And for each of these categories, these vantage points, I have a list of key information that your team needs to have as a foundation for making strategic choices. I have three or four questions at each vantage point that your team needs to be able to answer to make a strategic decision. And you're already gonna have some of these answers. But something that I've noticed is that teams typically either have a mute, either have a vantage point gap where one of these is missing, or they have competency gaps kind of sprinkled throughout that make everything feel really insecure and squishy. So 
we're going to go through and address at each vantage point what the information is that your team needs to have to make the call, to make the strategic choice, and to feel confident about it. So as you're going through this, think about your organization or maybe you know the last organization you were with and think about whether they can, you can answer these questions, answer each of these questions. And I want you to think about this as like an assessment that you're doing of your key strategic information. Can you answer this one? Can you answer that one? And how confidently can you answer the question? Because the confidence is also at play here. You might want to put some more research points into that question if it's low confidence. All right, so key competencies. That's what I call these questions, the, this information you have to have. And let's start with need. So the very first thing in the need vantage point is Determine what measurable effect does the problem or the need produce in the world? Measurable effect. And I define measurable effect here a little bit. So if your entire target population adopted your product, what is the single number that you would use to measure success? And I know, I know I'm talking to, I'm preaching to the choir here. It's like outcome, outcome versus output, all that. But, but it's really important to get clear on this measurable effect. And I keep, I, I have it in here, but it needs to be observable and it, it needs to be something you can count, something you can count. So I'll, I'll try to give you an example here. Um, well, okay. I'm co-founder of the guild sales pitch all of a sudden. Uh, I should plan these things. So um, I, I'm the co-founder of the guild and, you know, we have a, a mission within the guild. We share all this content and stuff, but we also have researchers that we place with clients. So we have this kind of staffing and placement and meeting talent and client uh, projects, that arm of the guild. And um, I guess when it comes to the measurable effect that we're trying to produce in the world, like our, our mission is a lot of things, but if I'm, if I'm really going to get down to what the measurable effect is, it's like the number of projects in the world that have research behind them. We want to see that number go up. We want to see more projects in the world that have research backing them. Now, there are other reasonable numbers we could pick, like maybe the number of employed fractional UX researchers. Um, so depending on the number we pick, it's a different it's a different business strategy. It's a different um, mission and vision. So but but it needs to be countable and, and it needs to be something that you can observe. So if you had all, all the information in the world, you could observe it. So measurable effect. All right. So after the measurable effect is determined, you need to know what conditions produce the most extreme version of the need. What conditions? So like, I don't know, for the guild again, uh, maybe there were there were layoffs and budget cuts. And so now folks are looking to like fractional project by project talent. Um, these are the kinds of conditions that produce the most extreme version of the need. And then finally, you need to know how do people perceive the need in the context of the guild is like, do, do companies even know that they should have a researcher? Do they see value in researchers? How do they perceive the problem? How do they perceive this situation? How do researchers perceive it? So these are the three key questions that I think every team should be able to answer at this vantage point. The measurable effect, what conditions produce the extreme version of it, and how do people perceive the need or the problem? And if you don't have all three of these questions answered, 
I've listed some possible methods that you already know. You can, you already are familiar with these as product and UX folks. Um, maybe not diary studies, but probably uh, you could Google it. And um, I'm, I'm just saying like in-depth interviews, diary studies, field research, these are the kinds of methods that you would need to use to answer these key competency questions. So if you have gaps, those are your methods that you can start brainstorming on how to answer these questions. Okay. And, and I think just one more point on the methods, it's like, you're not gonna be able to figure out how people perceive the need in the world through a quantitative survey. You see what I mean? Like that's not probably going to be your best method. So I think folks are already doing this, right? We do discovery work and such. Great, so let's move on to the next vantage point. Um, when it comes to people, you need to understand the people. My key questions are, what characteristics or behaviors are absolutely required to experience the need? So in uh, going back to the guild thing, uh, you, you kind of have to be a business. It's required. I mean, to experience the need that we just talked about, you, you have to be a business. And maybe we could, you know, talk about like a business that has a product team. Maybe we can strain it that, that far. But what are the requirements? What must people have to be experiencing the need? And then you need to find out how prevalent are those required traits in the world. And if this is starting to feel like total addressable market, it's because it is, right? It kind of maps to that. So how prevalent is the potential for the need in your population of people? After you get that, the requirements, same thing, but now we want the common characteristics and behaviors. So what characteristics and behaviors are common among the people who are experiencing the need? This is starting to feel like a persona, right? Like you're going to make a Bob the Banker, Rob the Banker. <laughs> I mean, that's, yeah, that's the joke. And I forgot the joke <laughs> that I made. All right. So you're going to put, you could package this information in a persona, but you need to be able with your persona deliverable to answer these key questions. What's required? characteristics and behaviors, what's common, characteristics and behaviors. And then finally, who else, who else influences the need? Who else is at play in this situation? Um, either affecting the need or affecting the people who have the need. One thought on like common, common characteristics and behaviors, my rule of thumb is greater than 25%. I, I probably don't really want to hear about it unless that characteristic is at least 25% of my folks. So there, there's a sort of rule of thumb for you. And then yes, you can probably package this up however you'd like if that's a user persona or something like that. That makes sense. Your possible research methods here are number one, qualitative surveys, so that you can start to uncover like what are the behaviors and characteristics that exist out there. But you're going to have to do some kind of quantitative survey or hire that out somewhere um, to get this information. The prevalence, how common is 25% is of my population um, doing this behavior. To, to know that you have to do a larger scale quantitative survey. And then finally, in-depth interviews will help you fill in the gaps here. Okay, when it comes to those who influence the need, you may, depending on how extreme that influence is, you may need to also answer these questions about your influencing people. So keep that in mind as well.
The next vantage point is context. So key competencies your team needs in context are what factors influence the measurable effect? So what factors, market forces, situational things affect um, your measurable outcome that you identified? Notice I'm not saying competitors. I mean, it includes competitors, but there are many, many things regulations, laws, um, social movements that could affect that measurable outcome. Uh, robbing the bank example, like, you know, if we focus on other folks who are going to rob the same bank as us, we're going to completely miss that part of the context is that we're probably going to have law enforcement on our tails, right? They're not a competitor, but they're very much a force uh, that we need to account for. So what factors influence the measurable effect? Who else is changing the measurable effect? This is where kind of competition comes into play, but it's a little bit more broad than that. And how successful are they at changing the measurable effect? And then finally, what keeps those players from making a bigger impact on the measurable effect. What is constraining anyone from making a bigger impact, whether that's positive or negative, on your measurable effect? So if we were looking at the UX Research Guild um, example, number of projects that have research behind them. You know, there are other players outside of direct competitors for the guild that could influence the number of projects that have research behind them. Like one popular product person who has a really popular blog could just say, we don't need researchers anymore. And that could affect our measurable effect. Like we could see the number of projects with research behind them go down because of that. It's not a competitor, but they're a force we need to, we need to understand. Okay, so... Possible methods here, no surprise, competitive analysis. It's a, it's a lot of understanding the competitive landscape, but also quantitative and qualitative surveys will do you well in this space to understand what those other factors are and beyond your competitors, the who else question, who else is affecting um, your measurable outcome? Okay, next vantage point final vantage point here is value. Value. So what do people expect? What do people expect of the product? Um, those expectations are going to affect how value is perceived. So knowing what people's expectations are is a huge, huge thing. Then what capabilities must the product have to change your measurable effect? Going back to the guild, like, well, we have to have access to researchers or else we're probably not going to affect the number of projects that have research backing them. Maybe, maybe we could like, it's an AI thing. Ooh, no, gross. Why do you let me say that? Um, but we need, we need some kinds of capabilities, right? So what must be present for the measurable effect to change? Next, we have some internal things, some internal questions, like what resources are available to improve the product's impact on the outcome? And then what constraints do we have that inhibit the product's impact on the outcome, on the measurable effect? So sometimes we have to operate within a certain price band or we have really costly operations. And this is where the execution comes in to the strategy. We need to know some of these resources and constraints so that we know how, how to rob the bank. And this, this is analogous to who's on our team and what can they do? Do we have a sharpshooter? Maybe we should leverage that. So assessing, assessing the value. Possible methods here, concept testing, 
product concept testing, um, pricing research, again, around expectations, right? What do people expect of the product? Uh, concept testing around expectations and also what capabilities must the product have to affect the outcome. And finally, qualitative interviews. And I put this in here both because externally you can understand expectations better from your users if you're doing some qualitative interviews, but also internally, because sometimes we don't even really have internal alignment around what are our resources? Um, what interesting things do we have to leverage that could crank the dial on the product's impact toward our outcome? And also sometimes we forget, but not outside of product. We never forget the constraints, right? All the constraints that weigh on you. So sometimes qualitative interviews internally can help you answer those. Okay, so these are the four vantage points. And these are the questions that I think every team needs to be able to answer to even begin to make some informed strategic decisions. So let's look at tactically, um, boots on the ground. What does this kind of thing look like to implement? I imagine the delivery here is filling in all of these competencies, either with data that you already have, or maybe as a leadership team, the assumptions that you're comfortable making. So maybe we don't have hard data on something, but we're really comfortable making an assumption about what those conditions are that produce the most extreme version of the problem. Maybe everyone's aligned on that. So maybe we don't need to go collect data on it. But as a team, you need to go through and make sure that we can all answer these questions. Not just can we all answer them, but are we all giving the same answer? Oh boy, it's our favorite game. Is everyone gonna give the same answer? If I take 10 random employees from a company, could they, could they give me the same kinds of answers to these key competencies? So you'll want to look at this like a checklist of information and maybe there's some, you know, strong disagreement, let's say, in leadership about what, what characteristics do people have? What are some of the common characteristics that people have who are experiencing the problem? So common characteristics here under people. Maybe marketing and product disagree. Maybe they disagree on that. What that looks like is chaos because then marketing shows up to rob the bank and they have dynamite. They've brought dynamite. and But, you know, product shows up and they've brought disguises because they think we're going to sneak into the back door of the bank. And explosives and disguises don't go very well together in terms of how we're going to rob the bank. So alignment around this information is really key, super key. So you'll orient to these research questions. And look, this framework is, it's an 80% of the way there, 80% of the time. There's going to be unique domain-specific questions that you need to answer to make informed strategic decisions. But I think these capture a lot of a really good foundational starting place for most industries that I've been in and for most teams and most stages of companies that I've worked for. So you'll also probably use additional research methods at each stage. Totally fine, those were not prescriptive. Those were just to get your mind thinking about the things you already do, the stuff you're already comfortable with and how it can help you answer some of these questions. And once you have all of this information, all of the boxes are checked either with data, or confident assumptions, confident, comfy assumptions. Once everyone agrees, that's what I'm calling a strategic brief. You've got this awesome, you know, one to two pager of all the key competencies that people need about the, about the business, about the organization. And I think this thing should go out to everybody in the organization. So Everyone should know what the need is, who the people are, what the context is, what the value is. 
And I think that it's it's through alignment that you you don't just have a good foundation for good strategic choices, but you actually have a good foundation for effective execution because everybody's moving in the same direction. And when we all show up to the bank and we all know that it's dynamite we're using and we all know the path here, if something goes wrong, the unforeseeable things, the the things we got a little bit wrong in our information, when something goes off course according to our plan, our strategy, we all have the same information. So we're all able to use that information together. Uh, we all know there's no back door to the bank. So no one's going to try to go out the back door when something goes wrong because we all know there's no back door. So getting that alignment, I think, is what sets organizations up for success to make these strategic decisions and then to execute that strategy. And will be really effective when something goes wrong uh, or when things change. Wow, the bank got new staff uh, since our information. So now we have to adapt. Okay, so create a stri strategic brief. That's, that's a call to action and share it and, and get everybody aligned around this kind of thing. All these key competencies. And I just want to talk through a high level example in case some of this isn't sticking very well. So the one I've got, and we'll kind of feel our way around it together. The one I've got is, uh, you've seen all those tools for taking meeting notes, Grain and Otter and the bots show up. We have one on the call now. The bots show up and they, they transcribe the meeting and they take notes. So let's imagine that we work for one of these tools and maybe we're going through the strategic vantage points and we discover that we can answer all of the questions about the need. We know we know how the problem exists. Maybe we know the measure the measurable effect, let's say, could be um, well, it could be like the number of meeting notes that get read. And maybe it's our our AI that we're focusing on. But actually, maybe we're just trying to reduce the number of follow-up emails sent after each meeting. Maybe that's like that North Star measurable outcome. So reduce the number of follow-up emails sent after each meeting. So everyone can just go read the transcript or read the summary, whether they were in the meeting or not, or left early or not. Okay, so maybe we know the need really well. Maybe we also have a really good understanding of, of the individuals, the people. So how people perceive the need and um, who, what kind of characteristics they have, what behaviors are common within that group. But maybe we find that we can't actually really agree on the context questions. So like some of us feel like the tools that reduce the number of, of meetings after, or reduce the number of follow-up emails after a meeting. Um, maybe we feel like our direct competitor is pretty successful at doing that. And some of us don't feel like our direct competitor is very successful at doing that. Or some of us feel threatened by, there are these tools that are, are just geared toward reducing the number of meetings. And do we want that as a, as a meeting summary tool? Is that a threat to us? Is that a factor we should be concerned about? It is changing our measurable effect. So, Maybe we lack some, some of the context alignment at that vantage point. Maybe we have some misalignment about our constraints as an organization. It's so common that you know some folks think that the technology can do certain things and other folks think that the technology cannot do certain things. So we might have those, those constraints and resources misaligned among us at the context vantage point. So as a team, what we need to do is conduct the research to answer the questions in the context vantage point and in the value vantage point. Or we need to facilitate that research, that data being collected somehow. And then 
agree, agree once we have a level of confidence and alignment around those key competencies. So maybe after that, we're ready. We're ready to determine our product strategy. And it's not that the data makes the decision for you. I'm sorry. Spoiler. The data doesn't make the decision for you, but it sure does make it clear what the paths are. Like if we know certain things about the bank, if we know they've been robbed before through people in disguises, that's probably not a viable path. And I think all reasonable people would agree that like maybe we're not going to take that path because maybe they have some security in place now that they've experienced that. Maybe we're going dynamite. So the paths become really clear once you have this foundational information. But it doesn't take the decision-making out of it. No one's surprised, but I feel like I'm breaking your heart. My final thought here is just, this is business. So when it comes to forming your strategy and making those decisions, uh, there's always going to be risk. Don't let the risk come from these kind of lack of competencies within. Don't let the risk come from internal. Don't let marketing show up with dynamite and products show up with disguises. That's a foolish risk to take, right? That's not how we want to rob the bank. We don't need risk at that level. This whole venture is risky enough. So don't let the risk come from internal. Let it come from the execution. Let it come from the external. It, are we going to pull it off, the plan, right? And um, yeah, avoid that unnecessary risk. So I also think that your job as a product person is to make strategic choices based on the information that you have. And when everyone aligns on the information, like I said before, it's easier to course correct the team. It's easier to update the information when, when you're wrong. It's easier to see when you're wrong. And it's easier to update the plan during the execution phase. So there will always be risk. Choose the right risk. And go forth and assess the gaps in your team's strategic vantage points collect the data to fill out your team's key competencies. Thank you very much. I will take a peek at questions in the chat here. Looks like there were some questions about um, measurement and qual. Don't think qual can't be counted. Um, but it looks like someone jumped on that for me. Let's see. Oh, the rationale, uh, Jennifer asked, like, what's the rationale behind greater than 25% is a common behavior? There's no rationale. It's a feeling. Um, I've aggregated a couple of, like, chief product officers that I've talked to. And I often hear that, oh, we're not going to, we're not actually going to act on anything that is of medium impact unless it affects greater than 15% of our customer base. Like we're not gonna, we're not gonna build that feature unless greater, we're not even gonna consider it unless greater than 15%. So I say 25% is like, we should all kind of know about that trait if that happens, but it is totally a heuristic, like, you know, um, just a just a wild guess. And I think as a team, you all should, should figure that out. <laughs> but what if I'm disguised as an explosive? Oh, I enjoy that one. Yes. Oh, good question. So do you recommend different studies for different vantage points or doing it together? Um, there, This is a, a checklist and I have no, no feelings on how that checklist can be checked. So I think, especially on a budget, I try to combine as many research questions in in my research studies as possible. So I think that however you can approach that, as long as it makes sense, right? You can't send a half hour survey out to the world. Good luck for you. 
So making sure that you're using your methods and they're attacking the different questions. But when it comes to getting that information, sometimes just secondary research can get you a pretty good sense of that information. And then everyone feels good about it and we move on. I, I think so some some questions around like research and business strategy. It's hard as someone who has worked at many product focused organizations often business strategy and product strategy are like tied together in the middle. So I I think a lot of the things that I'm talking about, some folks would say, that's market research. That's not product research, especially for the context, like the competitors and such. But I hold by this, if you don't have that key information, regardless of who collects that information, maybe it's owned by the marketing team. But if your team doesn't have that that information product side, you can't make really confident strategic decisions. Like you're going to be off the mark a lot. So the, the fake lines in the sand around where marketing ends and product begins, or even like customer success and all of those things, I don't think they apply as much to this framework. I think every team needs all of this information to get a read on the situation. And then you'll all need your individual like getting more and more specific, more and more tactical questions. Well, um, I think we're wrapping up. So I'll hand it back over to Helen. Thank you all for being here. And I welcome, we have a survey, which Helen will mention. I welcome feedback in the survey. I'll read all of them. <laughs>